Good afternoon and welcome everyone. My name is Taja Fox and I'm the communications officer here at the Health Council. I want to thank everyone for joining us for this amazing presentation. Joining me today is Dr. Jonathan Makandrula, a consultant urological surgeon here in Bermuda. Today, Dr. Jonathan will give us an overview of health disparities and the diagnosis and treatment of cancer and how the COVID pandemic has exposed these issues. After the presentation, again, you are welcome to share your comments and questions in the comment section. Now, I would like to welcome Dr. Jonathan to begin today's webinar event. Uh, many thanks for having me um, here today. Um, I'll just share my screen and get straight into it. So thanks for, to the Bermuda Health Council for the opportunity to present a topic that's quite dear to my heart. Um, I've presented and worked and researched on this for a number of years now with cancer care and, and, the, and what's happened with the, with the ongoing or recent COVID pandemic has blown open this topic in, and put it into sharp focus across the world. So before I start, just a little bit about me. So I'm a surgeon here based in Bermuda as of a month ago. Uh, but I grew up and was born in London to West African parents. Um, my bachelor's degree is in computer science. I'm actually a bit of a techie before going into medical school. Um, I switched careers and entered medical school a few years ago and completed my surgical training in London, rotating between North and South. I worked for the Department of Health in, an, in the national IT program, and I was able to uh, get into urology match program and I was first in the country. So that was quite a proud achievement. Uh, I was a laparoscopic fellow at King's College Hospital and, and did a fellowship in Sri Lanka in 2017, and then became a consultant five years ago in London. Um, during that time, I was a recipient of a one million pound grant um, from the NIHR, looking at artificial intelligence systems in prostate cancer care, and that study is still ongoing. And I moved to Bermuda with my wife, who's a Bermudian doctor as well, uh, a month ago, and actually started starting today uh, as a consultant urologist at King Edward Memorial Hospital. So. A pleasure to meet everyone and, and introduce myself. So we'll get straight into the topic. Um, what we're going to learn hopefully over the next 30 to 40 minutes is looking at the nature of health disparities, how we try and obtain strategies to minimize these disparities at, at a population level, and what we can all do individually to identify and deal with these health disparities. So uh, what, we can't talk about health disparities without talking about COVID-19, and, uh, and this really blew open the issue. Many of us in healthcare knew there was a problem, but data wasn't being collected robustly enough. And with all the data that was collected with COVID, we found some glaring disparities in, in terms of the people that got COVID initially, and unfortunately those that died with COVID, with people from black and minority ethnic groups more a higher risk of contracting and dying from COVID-19. And it really looked, and people start to look into the reasons that why this happened with the wealth of data that we had available. And in the United Kingdom, where I'm, where I'm from initially, uh, there was a lot of headline news regarding um, health disparities in COVID and not COVID. And, and every day, it wasn't, there wasn't a day where there wasn't another health disparity exposed, looking at maternity care, uh, looking at back, the backlog of surgery within the National Health Service and waiting lists. Uh, we know that there was mistrust in vaccines within uh, black groups and minority groups. And that led to poor outcomes in some of these groups. So that was always featured in the news as well. And this is a really nice slide that summarizes some of the health inequality seen. We know that black women are more likely to die than white women in pregnancy. South Asians have a higher death rate uh, from ischemic heart disease and cardiovascular disease than the general population. And if you're a South Asian or black person, you're two to four times likely to develop type two diabetes. So the, health, the data's there and the data does not lie. And we're now as, as healthcare professionals and the wider population, we're trying to reduce this gap and try and seek to get understanding so we have more equitable healthcare for all, because that's a basic human right. So I think what I normally will start off is explaining the background behind this and where as researchers we look into areas we look into. And I think one of the major ones is social determinants of health. So these are conditions in which places where people live, learn, work, and play that really affect a wide range of health risks and outcomes. 
And the, there are five key areas of social determinants of health. And I'll just give you a flavor of them. There's a lot of work being research, researched into this, but I'll try and give the viewers and the listeners just an overview. So the first one is healthcare access and quality. And in the United States, we know one in 10 people don't have healthcare at all. And looking at the pop data from Bermuda, it's about similar, but Bermuda also suffers from an issue of underinsurance. So people have their insurance, but when they come to use it, they realize that there's a lot of things they cannot do without extra co-payments or, um, or restriction and where they can go for treatment. So that's a big problem that we face. We know that people without insurance are li less likely to have a primary healthcare provider, and they may not be able to afford the healthcare services and medications they need. And having worked in Bermuda over the past three years as a visitor, this is one thing that I definitely see a lot of. Uh, we think about there are strategies to increase insurance cover coverage rates, and I know the government in Bermuda are trying to look at that, and there's a lot of debate and discussion about that, but really want to get as many people uh, having access to healthcare services, especially preventative care, and treatment for chronic illnesses like diabetes and hypertension, which are big problems here in Bermuda. And we know sometimes people don't get the recommended healthcare services they need like cancer screenings. And if you don't have a primary healthcare provider or a GP, you don't get access to this. And certainly as a urologist, I see men that have got uh, very high PSA levels for prostate cancer. They've never seen a GP in their time and they present to hospital with cancer that's already spread around the body. So that's a real big problem. And this is one of the social determinants. The second issue is um, education access and quality. We know that people with higher education levels are likely to be healthier and live longer. And when I say education, it doesn't necessarily mean just going to university. It just means, uh, so university is not always for everybody, but having a vocational training and access to uh, learning and, um, uh, and a good quality job. Uh, but we know high quality educational opportunities for children and adolescents help them do better in school. Children from low income families or children with disabilities especially uh, experience forms of social and racial discrimination. And they're less likely to graduate from high school or go to college, which means they get less safe or higher paying jobs, uh, which means they don't get primary healthcare uh, access and they have higher rates of heart disease, diabetes and depression as well. Again, we're not here to generalize because there are people that have not had access to this and do extremely well, but we know the odds are stacked against you if you don't even finish from high school. The second social determinant of health is social and community context. So people's relationship and interactions with families, friends, co-workers, and your wider community is really important. This can have a major impact on your health and well-being. Many people face challenges and dangers they can't control, like unsafe neighborhoods, if you can't afford to pay very high rents or mortgages to live somewhere, discrimination with landlords or, or, or your housing authority, or trouble just getting the basic things they need. And this can have a negative impact on your health and safety, especially if you haven't, you're living from paycheck to paycheck and don't, and don't have the resources of family support. This can really cause a lot of stress, which can impact your health. And we know positive relationships at work, at home, and community can help offset these negative impacts and improve your well-being and health. So social and community context is really important and one that's really underplayed. And I think it does play bare, bare relevance, here, especially here in Bermuda. Economic stability. We know people with steady employment are less likely to live in poverty and be healthy, but they have, and but many people have trouble finding and keeping a job. And especially in these current times, I'm from the UK where we're now heading to a depression, a recession. And we see this a lot, especially in people presenting to emergency room with stress and anxiety because of um, economic issues. People with disabilities or injuries like, such as arthritis or chronic back pain may be especially limited in their ability to work. And we know that if you can't work properly, have a steady job, you don't have, you can't afford the things to stay healthy, such as basic medication or pay your rent or water rates, and you can end up homeless. And that has a really detriment, that has real detrimental impact on health homelessness. Employee programs, counseling, high quality childcare, and can really help people find and keep jobs if they're not worrying about the other things that affect their life. And in addition, we need policy to help people pay for food. In the UK now, there's an increased reliance on food banks where people donate food and people use them. And it, this can affect, have a knock on effect on housing, healthcare, 
and really focusing on these areas to improve poverty, to reduce poverty and really improve health and well-being. And these are things that governments and, and, and local authorities can do to help. And finally, the neighborhood and built environment. We know that neighborhoods uh, where people live have a major impact on their health and well-being. And in the United States, we know a lot of people live in neighborhoods where there's unsafe, violent, they tend to be more black or minority people, but that's over discriminate, over emphasizing because there are poorer white poor populations in America as well. People have unsafe air. I know in Bermuda, there's a lot of debate about the Belco towers and whether the air around there is safe or water and other health and safety risks. And we know there's a major crisis in Jackson, Mississippi, which is a predominantly black neighborhood where in, can you imagine in modern day America, there are people living with access to clean water. People are having to, uh, boil water or, or government giving them drinking water because there's a crisis in sanitation. So this is not just a third world problem. People see pictures of Africa, kids with no water, but this is happening in the United States, the most powerful and richest country in the world. And we know that racial and ethnic minorities and people with low incomes are more likely to live in places with these risks and exposed to things that can harm their health, such as secondhand smoke or noise as well, which can really have a detriment to le learning and people's mental well-being. So moving across into cancer, we know, look at, and this is a, a graph from the SARE database, which is a large US mortality database with millions of people on there. Many researchers have studied uh, cancer deaths by race, ethnicity, location. We know that non-Hispanic black men have a higher rate. So 174 per 100,000 populations, that's quite high in terms of uh, cancer death. This is all cancer, so put together, compared to non hispanic Asian or, or island persistence, which have, have always traditionally had the lowest rate of cancer. Uh, we know that for all cancers combined, black men have the highest rate of new cancer diagnosis and comparing to Asian Pacific Islander men, which have the lowest rate of cancer diagnosis. And again, this graph bears that whereas men here uh, and, uh, and, for, uh, and black men and women uh, here uh, compared the two. And in terms of death from cancer, again, the stats are quite clear that amongst men and women, black people have the highest rate of cancer deaths. And again, Asian and Pacific Islands have the lowest rates of cancer deaths uh, across all cancer types and based on US mortality data. And I try and explain with what we've discussed before, some of the reasons why this may be happening. There are others. And for breast cancer, again, um, uh, black women have the high, and it's been coming down slowly over the year because of better screening, but again, black women have the highest rate of cancer deaths for breast cancer in the United States. And this data you can use in the United Kingdom or parts of Europe as well. So it does bear true across different healthcare systems, whether it's a public healthcare system like the United Kingdom or a private healthcare system like the United States, the data is quite stark in these groups. Uh, with something that I'm more close to my heart, which is prostate cancer, I won't go into details, but there's a recent study that came out that showed that even with people that have high PSA levels, which is a prostate cancer blood test and access to MRI scan, which is a scan needed to help diagnose who needs to have biopsies, there was discrimination finding that the database found that black men were less likely to receive a prostate MRI compared to white men. Now, this may be, there was found that this may be due to the fact that physicians weren't recommending um, PSA levels to black men but also some of the um, black men were less likely to have health insurance or have good coverage to get the MRI scan. So they were multifactorial with population issues and interaction between the doctor and the patient where uh, we found that, or it was found that the predominantly white physicians weren't offering uh, uh, the diagnostics to the black men. And again, there are reasons why this happened and we'll go into that. But this is not just a US, USA problem. You know, I'm from the UK and we think we have a public healthcare system which is free at the point of need. And whether you're a rich man or poor man, prince or pauper, you get access to the good old NHS. But actually this study came out earlier this year, which showed that men who are older have more comorbidities, socially economic depraved or black ethnicity were less likely to receive radical prostate cancer treatment compared to other groups. And this was the first paper that showed that within a publicly funded NHS system, there were still massive health disparities in the way we treat cancer care in the UK. And the, the authors go on to conclude that it's really unclear why there's treatment variation. They think it may be due to local healthcare resources, 
knowledge and skills of the professionals in dealing with population groups. They blame the patients, saying patients don't understand maybe their treatment and patient choice have all been used to, as excuses, and I use the word excuses deliberately, into why there's treatment uh, variation. But one thing that, our, that we looked at in our data was, are there staff factors? And the elephant in the room was that there are less people of color in healthcare. And I think that understanding and that, uh, and that level of interaction and that distrust is there where some groups may not wanna see a doctor or go to their primary care physician because they just, they don't trust what's been said. And we, we've seen this with COVID message where despite the message coming out, there were certain groups that dis, just did not get the COVID vaccine. We found that when more people of color and physicians and healthcare people of prominence were given this message, the, the rates of vaccine uptake were increased. So there is something in this here in terms of human factors. And we know that we need to prioritize research in terms of in terms of cancer for all groups and have more diversity in the people that are running the trials. We need targeted recruitment for people within trials because at the end of the day, trials are the only way we can get new learning in terms of how we treat cancer care. And we may have to go on to say there's actually quotas to make sure we've got a fixed number of minority patients in research so we're getting access to the highest quality evidence and diagnostics. And there are specific health interventions that we know that are focused on black minority populations. I won't go into detail on this study, but there was a study in New York with black barbershops looking at blood pressure reduction. And they compared groups of men that uh, went to barbershops with normal kind of uh, going in and just talking about blood pressure, or they trained the barbers and pharmacists to go with specific health intervention to really under teach men whilst they're waiting for their haircuts about blood pressure, how to take their medication, and why it's very important to keep your blood pressure under, con under control. It was a five-year study and they found significant improvements in the groups where there was targeted interventions in the barber shops. And these were men that were not going to their GP, to their primary care physicians or hospitals. So they brought the hospital to their local environments. And we found that actually you can improve significant uh, improvements in blood pressure for these groups if you target them. So these are studies that show we're trying to do things in a different way than the status quo. This is a study that came out that looked at um, uh, patient information for prostate cancer communication. And they looked at hundreds of um, um, communication across the internet. Uh, and they found that there was a, a reduction in the number of physician, um, pe physicians of color given information. And when this happened, black men were less likely to have trust in the healthcare information that was given. And this, you may go on to say, well, they may le then less likely to see their urologist or their doctor if the information isn't given in a sensitive way. And I'm not saying that every patient, black patient has to see a black doctor, but I'm saying all, all physicians have to be trained in, um, in cultural awareness. So we understand there's more than just a patient with a disease, but there's a human being with think, thoughts and feelings about how their health is to be given. We shouldn't be dismissive as doctors about that, but really try and work with patients to understand what's going on to help their, their health care. Um, but we know that experts agree the biggest reason for health for inequalities is structural and cultural barriers. We know, as I said before, people cannot pay co-pays on medication. There's poor communication about side effects, which make it harder for certain groups to really have their cancer treatment. And I've seen that personally uh, in the United Kingdom. But I'm not here to give all doom and gloom. There are solutions and ways we can help improve this. One, one uh, program called the Accountability for Cancer Through Understand, Undoing Racism and Equity the cure um, system put systems in place to act as safety nets to help sure no patient falls through the cracks, whether they're black or white or other. And they've done this um, in three parts. The first one is using nurse navigators who are trained to understand the response to struggles of ethnic groups and especially black patients they face, such as mistrust of the establishment, miscommunication, access to transport, they couldn't even get to the hospitals, financial hardship, and actually taking time off work to come and see a doctor. So the navigators met face to face with the men at different times and were their focal point of contact when they could not get through to the doctors or nurses who were busy. The second one was an alert system where if the patient did not come for the appointment, the nurse navigators were alerted in real time so then they can follow up uh, with the patient to make sure why they did not come and see the doctor or come for their treatment such as cancer treatments. And this really made a big imp um, improvement in making sure patients were not lost to the system and felt loved and appreciated and would then come across to have their treatment. The nerve navigators were patient advocates. So they knew the patients inside out 
they knew what their under health beliefs were, what their numbers were, and why they did the certain things they did. So they can help with their resources, help with transportation. Some people couldn't physically get to the hospital, so they increased telehealth visits and rescheduled appointments for patients. There was also help on pain management and financial assistance. So this was really intense and cost intensive as well, uh, intervention to really try and improve that. But sometimes these are things that are needed to try and help. And at the end of the day, you'd rather have a program like this, which costs a certain amount of money than treating metastatic or cancer that spread with millions of dollars of expensive cancer drugs. So it's, it's a cost-effective treatment when we look at it. And finally, enhancing accountability of the clinical team. So there were monthly reports on, on um, cancer treatments and not just because I get reports all the time about how my patients are doing, but we, they broke it down into racial uh, and age and, uh, and uh, basis. So with the stance so that we shifted from cancer centers looking at just outcomes overall, overall uh, and looking at um, outcomes independent of race as well. So this was a game changer in the way we report cancer and we try and uh, uh, look at it. And other target interventions, again, as a urologist, uh, we um, in colleagues in the Mount Sinai United States have got a big bus where they've spent millions of driving this bus into the into parts of the hoods uh, within Brooklyn and parts of um, um, New York, where they men were able to come in their own time and walk into the bus confidentially, have a blood test, get examined by a urologist, and then given more information where they can then uh, connect with the services in the hospitals. We've done something similar in the UK at the Royal Marsden Hospital with a man and a van where they drive to shopping centers and areas uh, where uh, traditionally healthcare services weren't reaching and bring healthcare directly to the people. And uh, this is something that actually has been studied now and being shown to work quite effectively. And actually I've been working with Bermuda Health Council and Department of Health about setting up similar schemes here in Bermuda, where we can go to places in Court Street or, or, or other parts in back of town where we can actually bring healthcare to people. Uh, and the work of Bermuda Canton Health have been doing as well for the last three years or years have been showing that this is helping, but we need something more sustained to improve the levels of cancer treatments here in Bermuda. So really the take home messages from my talk are, we, we have to acknowledge that there's a problem with healthcare disparities and not bury our head in the sand. We need to help design equitable systems from a population and local level where we just look, we not only look at the patients, but we look at the systems behind them to make sure that they are fit for purpose and fair and just for all. We need to appreciate that we're all responsible for uh, health crackers. It's not just a black or minority issue, but it's an issue as a population because a healthy population means more people that are productive in society, working and contributing to our wonderful society here in Bermuda. Uh, it's important that uh, all staff, front facing staff get um, diversity tra training. So we're uh, cultur culturally, aware of differences and nuances for patients. And we need better representation at higher levels to make sure that all groups um, are, are spoken for and we have better accountability, especially in cancer care here in Bermuda. And many thanks for listening to my talk. Uh, these are re uh, references. Um, I'm gonna make this talk available, the slides anyone wants to see, and I think the recording is gonna be available after for viewing as well. Many thanks for, your, for listening. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Jonathan. I think this presentation was very valuable to the listening audience. Um, as Dr. Jonathan has mentioned, you will have access to the replay on our YouTube channel as well as right here on Facebook. Um, we don't have any questions, uh, but I do want everyone to have the opportunity to reach out to you if you have any questions. What is the best avenue or way that they could reach you? It's probably just sending an email. I'm always available. It's Jonathan, uh, J-O-H-N-A-T-H-A-N dot Macanjola, M-A-K-A-N-J-U-O-L-A. -A -A. It's, it's going to be available on the slides at bhb.bm. So that's probably the easiest way to get hold of me um, and drop me an email uh, and uh, if there's any questions. Uh, but thank you for your time and pleasure to be introduced to Bermuda and meet everyone and hopefully see everyone soon. Yes, thank you. I appreciate it. And thank you everyone again for tuning in. If you need uh, any further information, the Health Council will make it available to the public. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us, Health Council at bhec.bm or give us a call at 292-6420. Thank you again, Dr. Jonathan. Please enjoy the rest of your week.